November 10, 1979, citizens in the young city of Mississauga were unaware that something catastrophic was about to occur. Some refer to it as the Mississauga Miracle. No loss of life, and no permanent scarring on the land, the people, or the collective psyche. Intangibly, the city that awoke amidst the thunderous explosions and mass evacuations in the early hours of November 11th was fundamentally changed. The first major evacuation and emergency faced by the young city tested its mettle, its leadership, its emergency services, its organization, and its citizens. The thing that I remember most was being at home and seeing a flash of light in my backyard. And I was at home with just my sister. My mom was out and thinking, oh my goodness, there's someone in my backyard with a flashlight because it was dark. And I got scared. And then, then there was a bang on my window. And then I was really scared because I thought there was somebody in there. We heard this huge explosion, wasn't it? Mm, yeah. And uh, a big flash in the sky, that's all I can describe. This plume of smoke, burning fire, didn't know what to do. And I was just standing out in the middle of Lakeshore and State Bank Road talking to a couple of people when the initial collision took place. And um, we could actually feel it coming, you know, uh, through the ground and, and the loud the banging and uh, we kind of all looked at each other and said what was that the boom was the boom the biggest boom i've ever heard um you really didn't know what was is this the end of the world what's happening here so yeah it was very scary it happened just as we were leaving the theater that night but i went to our living room window and there was the most beautiful beautiful colors I hadn't, I didn't realize how dangerous it was. We decided that we would put the first fire in our fireplace, it was a brand new house. And so we lit the fireplace and we're all sitting in the family room with a nice little fire. And all of a sudden one of my friends said, look at your backyard, it's all lit up. I looked out and I thought, oh my God, my roof's on fire. <laughs> in the morning I was preparing to go to uh, the uh, cenotaph service uh, because the next day of course that the, the crash occurred on November 10th and next day was November 11th and of course the uh, various legions were having their uh, cenotaph services whatever and I remember showing up early to the one on the Hensel Circle and smelling this acrid uh, uh, it was really I mean it was a mixture of chlorine and other something else and the sky was gray and there was something wrong. My son woke me up and said, Mom, uh, he went up on our roof and uh, he went as this huge fire, you know, and he came in and he said, Mom, I think the city hall is blown up. Uh, following morning, my brother and mom and dad uh, were invited to a church service downtown Toronto and we noticed a lot of ambulances heading westward on the QEW. Didn't know what that was about. Finally got back home and then heard the news. During the, the Saturday Night Live show, we were all watching it and then I heard this boom. We felt it. We were like, oh my God. And no parents were in the house. So we felt there was something that Maybe we did, or the stove blew up, or something. Um, I was six years old at the time, living on Kingsbury Crescent, which is basically Mavis and Queensway. Um, we were at a neighbor's house across the street celebrating a birthday party, and all of a sudden everything just, there was, we could hear a loud crash and bang. The house actually vibrated. And on the corner of Dundas and Mavis, there was a car dealership, and that car dealership suffered uh, broken plate glass windows all through it as a result of that explosion. I was nine years old at the time, but I remember um, we were very close to the railroad tracks. Uh, we're just near, maybe a minute away from Mavis. And I remember hearing a loud explosion in the middle of the night. Well, I didn't know it was an explosion at the time. I just heard a loud bang and it scared me. So I went upstairs to my parents' room and my mother was looking out the back window because we, the house backed onto a park and she was looking out the back window and I said, Mom, what was that loud noise? She goes, I don't know, I heard it too. 
And my father was like, oh, go back to sleep. It's just kids playing with fireworks in the park. <laughs> when the explosion happened, it woke us all up because the balconies were, were vibrating. But we had no idea what happened. You kind of know where you were when things happened. You know, I knew where I was when Kennedy got shot. I knew where I was when the Twin Towers came down. It's, it's sort of one of those things that sticks in your head. The, uh, the arena shook and we continued to play until, uh, until the Peel Regional uh, showed up. And they said, you have to get out of here. Uh, the second blast hit and we just saw the distinctive sky light up and a massive roar. And then we felt a massive wave of heat hit us. And my father looked at me and I was 12 years old at the time. And he said, you know what, son, this is no place for us. And we turned literally on our heels and went back to the house. I recall, uh, uh, getting the phone call at my home saying that we had a major uh, problem in the center of the city and uh, it uh, the dispatcher said at that time that it looks like it's on the railway but we're not sure at this point the crews are on their way. Now within a few minutes uh, the fire chief called me and said we have a major derailment at Davis Road. So we got to uh... Mavis Road and turned down and we looked, we could see a ball of fire, I don't know. Looked like it'd be several hundred feet in the air. And going down there, the thought crossed my mind, uh, I don't know whether this is a uh, war or hell, but. When I got to the top of the hill at Mavis Road in Dundas, I got there just as the first trucks were all starting to pull up. And I realized, hmm, it's not the gas main. Uh, that it was a train wreck and that just where we stood I could I realized that there was propane or liquefied petroleum gas involved in the fire and that we were going to have some huge explosions in a very short order so uh, when I got there I met with the district chief uh, uh, Ross Kelly and said like we got to get the people out of here uh, because we're going to have explosions and there's nothing we can do about it it's just going to happen Trains frequently carry hazardous materials through the city of Mississauga. CP Train 54 was carrying 106 rail cars from Sarnia to Toronto on a weekly scheduled run. 38 cars were carrying cargo that was considered hazardous materials, including liquid styrene, caustic soda, liquid petroleum products, and liquid chlorine. The cause of the accident was a hot box or an overheated journal box on car 33. At approximately 11:53 p.m., as the train crossed Burnhamthorpe Road, an axle bearing failed, and one rail car lost a pair of wheels. The train continued until approximately 11.56 p.m. at the Mavis Road level crossing, where 24 cars derailed. The first explosion, caused by ruptures in the butane and propane carrying rail cars, was seen more than 100 kilometers away. Several subsequent explosions, one of which hurled a 90-ton tanker car filled with liquid propane more than 675 meters away from the derailment site, followed the first explosion within minutes. The hot box was the reason for it to collapse. In other words, it was a box inside the wheel of the uh, train wheels, the two together. And that hot box wasn't properly lubricated or lubricated at all. And in the old days, they used to pour it in. Um, so it had lack of lubrication and burned off at the axle and the two wheels that came flowing out in a very dangerous way and there were a few cars uh, there that backed up <laughs> without turning around, just got backed right out. Uh, I met the two individuals who were the closest to the train derailment. They were the people in the Lincoln Continental. If you look at some of the photos of the 
derailment, you'll see a Lincoln Continental in a ditch. Uh, they were at the train uh, crossing when the accident occurred. Um, so they, they felt the full uh, fireball. Um, and in the pictures depicted, the car is slanted and in a ditch. That's because the couple uh, that were at that, that railway crossing uh, had to slip the car into reverse to escape the blast. The car uh, turned suddenly and went halfway into a ditch. The two car doors in all the pictures are depicted as being open because they ran. They ran out of that car uh, to get away from this massive explosion that had, had taken place. One of the things that you, you've, um, uh, you have to realize, if you can picture the railroad tracks at Mavis Road and a, a good quarter of a mile, a half a kilometer, whatever the measurement is, to the northeast, one of the rail cars actually ended up there. It, the explosion was so great that the, the, the rail car was catapulted airborne and landed in the, in the woods, wooded area there. And uh, this young fella drove this truck out to the street and what had happened was there was a piece of steel about five or six feet long and it had come off of the wreck because what had happened is one of the tank cars had exploded. And when that car exploded, it went right through the parks building and set the parks building on fire. But a piece of steel had come through and landed in the bed of the truck about a foot and a half behind where he was sitting in the front of the cab and set the truck on fire. People started screaming and uh, diving over that metal thing, yelling, we're all going to die. It's the propane and the butane that are burning in other tankers. We're impinging on the the chlorine tanker, which is kind of sitting up in the air with a hole up in the top. And so it was like a boiling kettle. And they called it a blevy, a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. And uh, so it's not the material on the top. It's the, it's the liquid inside that tanker that's boiling now, but it can't get out fast enough because it's, it's expanding so much. And uh, the hole wasn't big enough and uh, didn't want to make it any bigger. What the big problem at Mavis, where the whole accident happened, was the understanding that chlorine kills you dead. I been thinking back, I thought, you know, with all the chlorine gas, I mean, at the time, if I knew what chlorine was, it was something my mother put in the laundry, I don't know. Uh, I was, I was, it was explained to me about the chlorine and the chemicals and the only thing I knew about chlorine is it went in pools, so I didn't really see it as being much of a, of a danger. The tanker that had a great big hole in it uh, had 90 tons of chlorine in it. And that's liquid, okay, and that's why nobody called them dangerous commodities at the time, because it was just liquid. No big deal with the liquid, it's when it gets out into the atmosphere. And the worst part is, is that the coefficient of expansion is 800 times. So that 90 tons expands 800 times when it comes out into the air. We were, had come back late the night before, uh, did not know of the explosion. The following morning, my cousin and myself were both 12 years old. We went out to deliver newspapers as we separated and were doing our, our deliveries in the neighborhood, my eyes started watering. So I, when we were going, to, going back to meet up, we, uh, des I decided we will finish the route. And when I walked up to him, his eyes were watering. So I guess from the chemicals in the air, we were affected, did not know what was going on. When we came back home, uh, told our parents, turned on the news, and I was in the Cawthra Road area. Several hours later, we were evacuated. Mississauga. Police and firefighters, having been alerted by the high visibility of the explosion, arrived on the scene within minutes. Emergency personnel initiated the Peel Regional Police Disaster Plan, which coordinated the immediate institutional emergency response. Once the Peel Regional Police had established a command post, the Emergency Operations Control Group began to evaluate the situation. The disaster plan coordinated many volunteer support agencies, including the Canadian Red Cross, St. John's Ambulance, the Salvation Army, 
the Mississauga Humane Society, and the Ontario Humane Society, amongst many others. Evacuation centers were quickly established. As evacuation orders expanded, evacuation centers also had to relocate. Evacuation centers sheltered over 45,000 people. And so I got over to Mavis and Dundas. Uh, I was the first senior officer on scene, and there was probably five or six other officers there. And uh, two of them had gone up the road and could only go so far, and the explosions drove them back. So uh, the uh, uh, biggest thing was to say, we need help. <laughs> and we were very fortunate that it was the afternoon shift was just going home, and the midnight shift was just coming on. So we held everybody. So we had to double the staff immediately and uh, uh, set up a perimeter around and uh, started calling anybody you can find. They wanted to know if uh, there was any way uh, we could get numbers off the boxcars um, that they could compare with the manifest in order to determine um, just exactly what was involved in the um, Inferno. There, there was the two things. There was the fire, the possibility of explosions, further explosions, because there was fire all around. There were 11 tankers of propane. And from what we could figure out at the time, three of them had, had uh, uh, perforated and dumped their contents all in amongst these 23 uh, cars that were piled every which way on top of each other. And uh, so we, we walked up uh, to head to the, towards the tracks, and we got to the first building just below the tracks, and uh, it blew. And the one tank car uh, blew up in the air, and it just went like a rocket and landed on Square One's property. In the first oh, half hour, uh, there were the, there were two early on, and then there was another massive uh, explosion. Uh, it's called a blevy, which is a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. There was a tremendous uh, surge of energy that created a loud whistling sound that made us well aware that knew that a blevy was going to take place in one of the rail cars. Every time one was imminent, you could tell there would be a very loud hissing, screaming noise, and everybody would try and take cover behind buildings, in front of trucks, or, or in the, some, some of them hit the ditch on Mavis Road, just went down in behind culverts and things like that. When a tank car fails, there are certain signs. You have a few seconds, not a lot of time, but what happens is the pitch changes in the in the relief valve. Okay, there's a large relief valve that's letting all the pressure off. If the tank starts to open up, then there's no there's less pressure on the relief valve. The relief valve, uh, the pitch changes, the sound changes, and you know you've got a few seconds and you're going to have another bo uh, boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. So I realized that the one tank car was going to go, and I was standing right out in the middle of the open beside Mavis Road. So when the tank, the second tank car blew up. And it went due north, fortunately. And there was bits and pieces. There were pieces of steel coming down all over the place. The sky lit right up, and it was uh, quite bright. You could have been reading the newspaper. I never seen it myself, but I think it was Ronnie Pispelko was the driver. He, uh, I think he was the only one that actually seen the tank car take off like a rocket. My thought at that time was, oh my gosh, how many of our men are right close to where that happened? And it was one of real concern. And like I say, we were 300 meters away, and it seemed like it went from about a cold uh, fall night to about 100 degrees instantly. When the tank car started, as soon as I heard the change in the pitch, I knew this is it. So I st turned and I started to run. And everybody saw the guy with the white hat running, and they all started running with me. And then there was the explosion, and there was the you know the enormous flash of light, and then the shock wave hit us and knocked us all in the ditch. And I got up, and uh, Gary was beside me. I said, "Are you all right?" He said, 
yeah, I'm okay. He says, are you all right? I said, yeah. He says, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> and, uh, and so we got everybody moved back after that. So we, uh, we got back really quick <laughs> and uh, sent in the, uh, what the uh, placard said. And uh, they told us back immediately that you had some problems. You know, you've got uh, butane, propane, toluene, caustic soda. But worst of all, you've got chlorine. And uh, I guess what I knew about any of those things was what you saw in the stores, you know. So there was two distinct fire, um, fire operation areas. One was south of Mavis, of the railway tracks on Mavis Road, and the other was north. And there was no way to get from one to the other. And uh, then another explosion went off. Didn't send anything too far, but it wrecked all the buildings up there. The, the uh, uh, Parks and Rec uh, vehicle building, the one that they had all the uh, flowers and plants in for the city, and uh, just leveled everything. And uh, so we weren't going back there. We found the conductor. They brought him down to the to the command post, and he had what's called the consist list, which is basically a list of all the cars and the in the train and what's on them. So he said it was car 32, and so we looked at and started counting the cars. Propane, propane, caustic soda, chlorine. So where's this chlorine car? And the conductor says, I don't know. But it might be in the middle of the wreck. It might be in the wreck. So that was the first indication that we had the chlorine. Um, so then the, the thing was, was to find out what the car was that was still standing on the tracks. Because once we knew that, we knew which car had come off the track, the first one, which was a toluene car. We knew which car had started the derailment. Now we had to figure out what the last one was standing. And in between, then we could figure out where, uh, if the chlorine was in there or not. And uh, so we got the name, the car number off of the car at the back that was still standing and started counting through and said, oh, the chlorine's in the middle of the fire. Now we've got a big problem. At one time, a large piece of a tank car flew over the heads of the crew from Station 6, and some trucks needed to be hosed down to keep from burning. And the one piece went over 2,000 feet, I think it was 2,225 feet to the northeast, in a gray, just looked like a rocket, looping angle, and it come down and it hit the ground and dug about an eight foot crater. Uh, but uh, the chlorine, all of a sudden, you could start to smell this stuff. And uh, we were, as I say, at the, uh, the brick plant at Mavis and Dundas, and that's downwind. Everything comes from the west normally, and it's blowing all of that down to where we are. So uh, just said, we've got to get out of here. So we took the command post, which now was not only the emergency trailer with the truck pulling it, but about 16 police cars <laughs> and uh, some other people that had showed up in their own cars. And uh, we're, we went north uh, over and up, uh, I think it was Arendelle Station Road, and started to come back down Mavis. And there's a Bell Canada building there at the time. And uh, we just uh, opened the gate and uh, in we went and uh, set up the trailer and started to use that building because it had lots of telephones in it. <laughs> time of, um, we ran into a, a chlorine a gas um, I don't know if it was just in the in the air but it actually knocked us to our feet or to our to our knees and we it was so uh, once we realized what it was we got immediately out of the area there and uh, then we started to set up perimeters and uh, that was the because we had so many people we could do it very quickly uh, because there was people coming from all over, running out of their houses over on Ellen Gale and places like that, and uh, jumping in their cars down on uh, uh, on the Queensway, and you know where they lived, and driving up. Uh, so we had a, a pretty good uh, protective barrier so far. They had set up a command post at an old car wash down at the bottom of uh, at Mavis and Dundas, and so I went down and I met Art Warner, who was dressed in a tuxedo because he'd just come from his son's uh, uh, wedding. And uh, he said, uh, I'm going to take care of the operations out here. He says, you go to the command post and represent the fire department at the command post. 
when I got to headquarters, it was one of uh, organized confusion uh, because they were dispatching trucks and getting uh, reports from the scene. Crews settled in for a long duration of pumping enormous amounts of water on tank cars to keep them cool to avoid more explosions while the propane and chlorine mix was allowed to burn off safely. So uh, we all got together, which was the biggest thing you have to do, is get your minds together. They're the experts in firefighting, you know. They're the experts in trying to control people and stuff like that. And uh, so I mean, our first command post wasn't even in the trailer. It was standing outside. <laughs> we just got together. I was sent to Eglinton and here, Ontario. Now, here, Ontario was a four-lane road at that time. Eglinton was still two lanes. And when I got there to help out the officer by manually controlling the signals, he was uh, just beat. He was done. I don't know how long he'd been doing that, but he was just done. And he told me to go out in the intersection and start directing traffic. And I, I kind of questioned him. I said, I don't think I have the authority to do that. And he said to me, consider yourself deputized. I remember talking with Gord Bentley and, and, uh, and Art Warner and saying, well, uh, this is going. This isn't the one day. This is going to be a long-term event. We've got to start rotating people. We've got to get people rested. Right now, we've got all our resources here. We've got to start to uh, to rotate them. So um, we split up into shifts and work 12 hours on, 12 hours off at the site. Uh, for a for a fire department, uh, we think it's a very long call if um, if the incident lasts for three or four or five hours, but uh, this one was to unfold and uh, keep us busy for the next more than 10 days. We were on the scene for 250 hours and 33 minutes. We had, I guess it was a total of eventually uh, 1,800 officers and uh, Toronto sent out a, uh, quite a crew. Uh, Alton and uh, uh, Hamilton sent a few up. And uh, so we had pretty well the staffing we needed. Uh, what I do remember driving away was um, that there seemed to be a lot of um, a lot of movement in one direction where we were going, and that there were a lot of uh, police cars at the intersections and uh, you know that sort of thing. Uh, the railroad had brought some experts out. The government brought some uh, environment people out, and they had a big unit that we didn't even know existed. Uh, great big motorhome, but it drives around. It's got a little spinner on the top, and it pulls in air. And uh, it could tell us the parts per million of all the different chemicals. And they called everybody in. They called all the teams in. They called the doctors in. They called the nurses in. You know, this was uh, they were expecting major casualties, uh, naturally, from what happened. And he explained later that they had, uh, in the course of the evening, they had uh, exactly one casualty, and that was a news person who had fallen into a ditch and broken his, his ankle. <laughs> we needed some air breathing apparatus because the officers were starting to choke up, and uh, we still had to leave them on the farthest expanse of the uh, uh, of the area that we're concerned about. It was great concern for firefighters, but also for several thousand people who were within uh, the general area of where this uh, was happening. In recognition of their heroic actions at the scene, the Mississauga Fire Department received a special Ontario Medal for Firefighters' Bravery from the province of Ontario. Continual evaluation of the firefighting and emergency response measures, the progress of the fire, and the changing weather conditions resulted in a series of expanding evacuations, which, by Sunday evening, had encompassed most of the city of Mississauga, along with parts of neighboring Oakville and Etobicoke. More than 240,000 residents were evacuated in stages. In the midst of the burning wreckage was a leaking chlorine car. This, coupled with the magnitude of the accident and the weather conditions, resulted in a series of expanding evacuations. The first thing was to protect people. We've got to get them back because 
those explosions, we could have another five of them or we could have none. We don't know. Uh, but we can't let anybody in any closer. In fact, we've got to start backing them out. So uh, the first thing that we thought of, what's the best way to, where do we, where do we evacuate if we're going to move people out? And uh, everybody agreed that the southwest section had to be the first. So we took over, uh, over towards Mississauga Road and down to Highway 10 and just uh, shoved people down as far as the Queensway. So cars were blaring with the PA systems around the, through all the streets. And uh, as people would move out, then we'd move another couple of cars in at the intersection so they couldn't get back in. We were out playing road hockey when all of a sudden we heard the van coming around with the loudspeaker saying this area should prepare to be evacuated just in case. So I was eight years old and um, I, what, the first thing I can recall is uh, the door uh, bell ringing and uh, coming to the door and uh, having a couple of firefighters and a policeman at the door and asking to speak to my parents and um, after that I got the news from my parents that we were going to be uh, leaving for a couple of days for a little bit of a holiday and that was my first impression of what was going on for the uh, derailment. We got uh, transit buses brought in, Mississauga called all their drivers in. I brought the about 40 buses we had down there and uh, drove them on the, out in the parking lot and got anybody that could walk, was taken out and put on the bus. And the bus uh, went like, you know what, down the Queen Elizabeth Highway. We weren't in the first station. I think it was the Monday morning. I'm not exactly sure about that. When the police knocked at the door and told us to evacuate. We'd been half expecting it, but the police were, um, you know, I guess we knew what was coming. The police were very polite, everyone was included. I turned around and looked at my house when I realized it all could blow up. Um, and he couldn't really take anything. My my youngest was uh, a little girl, just a little girl, but her favorite was Anne, her raggedy Ann doll. She said, just a minute, mummy. She ran upstairs and I didn't. I said, you've got to come. And she had Anne in her arms. So that's all we got to take was Anne. Um, so we physically just got in the car and we drove to my grandparents thinking that we'd be back the same day. And she actually saw the explosion in her rearview mirror. Um, and so my, the story that my mother always told is we were always the, we were the first people who were evacuated because she drove home, scooped us out of bed, and drove to her sister's house. And so she, we evacuated before the evacuation order actually <laughs> took place. Uh, we ended up phoning a friend of ours who lived in North York, and they invited us to stay with them because they had a fairly large house. So it was more or less packing. Uh, it was myself, my mom, my dad, and two cats. So we, uh, I can imagine, I'm assuming that my parents got on the, on the phone with relatives living in Toronto. We were told uh, the exclusion zone and uh, the people that we had uh, best uh, relations or contacts with were our relations in Toronto. So we went to Toronto and I got a chance to miss a few days of school, hang out with my cousins, and it was a fun little time for me. I had no idea really what was going along, what was happening, I should say. So within a couple of days, our, our house was filled with people because my aunt and uncle on my mother's side, they had to get out of Cooksville, so they came to the homestead. A dear lady in Arendelle Woodlands was so traumatized, I think she described her uh, property insurance and her purse and managed to get down here to St. Peter's. And I remember dad and I coming down, I brought him down in my car and he drove her car back to the homestead because she, she was so shocked, she was so upset. A uh, couple other people south of the Queensway, they came to the house. And uh, so fortunately, we didn't have to leave. Early morning, about uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, we had a helicopter brought in so we could take a look and see where the, the some of the smoke was going. And uh, as soon as it got up, they called and they said, we got a problem. They said, that stuff's going straight right into the Mississauga General Hospital, right into all their air intake on the roof. And that's a 500-bed hospital. People had left without the prescriptions. Uh, there was uh, food needed for the children, the babes in arms. Drug stores opened up their stores and said, you know, we'll supply anything we can to help the people. So it was a pretty, pretty serious situation to see people there 
in their uh, nightgowns, etc. So the uh, provincial government assessed and uh, identified the number of ambulances that they could get, and uh, we got 135 ambulances from as far as Kingston and Chatham and Niagara. Uh, and they all came and they were all lined up along the Queensway and all into the emergency ward of the hospital. And uh, in two and a half hours, they emptied the hospital. So the community centers, that's kind of this community center, square one for a while and, and, and various uh, places, churches and things like that is where people migrated to and, and uh, had to be looked after for a few days. Later on that day, uh, the Queensway was loaded and some of the uh, stuff was going down into their air, uh, air pipes. So uh, some parts of them had to be evacuated as well, re-evacuated if you want to call it. And uh, then at the same time we're thinking uh, we had six nursing homes all on the Queensway and Highway 10, extend the care, those big places. And uh, so we had to evacuate them as well. The people have been evacuated. They weren't even given time to get dressed. They got out of their beds and said, out you go. They left uh, their animals. They uh, left their prescriptions. I mean, they, they were told to leave right away. It was very serious. And that they had opened up square one uh, to receive the people. So instead of... Uh, Going down to where the derailment was, I went to square one. By the Sunday afternoon, we had almost everything set up that you could want set up. Uh, we blocked everything south of Burnham Thorpe Road. Nobody could get in. Um, we used our 12 division over on Dixie Road as the staging area for Toronto police officers that came. And uh, OPP officers went and used the great big uh, training room in the basement there. And their, their sergeants gave instructions to their people and they supervised their people. All we did was we had inspectors go down and say, here's the next thing from the command post. This is what we have to do, and this is who we have to, the locations we have to put officers. And the OPP had the same thing. So I go back, and I, in my usual routine on the way to work, uh, we, our office was on uh, South Sheridan Way, was to stop at the Tim Hortons uh, in the, plaza, the plaza that's at Truscott and South Down Road, so for breakfast. So that, I pull in there, hop out of the car, go to the front door. <laughs> Wait a second, it's locked. So that is actually when it actually struck me that this was something real, you know, that because uh, I couldn't get my breakfast at Tim Hortons. And we got in the car and we were directed to go to square one. And I believe we were one of the first streets evacuated because there wasn't too many people there. But my sister and I were sort of happy. She woke up at that time. We saw our little friends and running around in our pajamas. And I remember staying at square one for a little while. My parents talking to other parents Everybody's sort of a little confused, trying to figure out what was going on, what had happened. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how, I think I fell asleep for a while, because I remember shortly thereafter that, my mother waking us up and saying, we have to leave again, because they had asked people from square one, saying, okay, we have to leave the square one area. I'm not sure where they were directed, but we ended up going to my grandmother's house. Uh, she was in Toronto. He came home and, and woke me up and said, hey, there's something really big going on. And I said, you yeah. know, <laughs> it's the middle of the night, you know, and so we all went back to sleep and, and uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I was then awoken uh, later on by, uh, by the sound of, of police. Um, the next day, uh, we were now having problems with everybody that got out. Where do they go? Some of them are still sitting on the side of a road somewhere, others are they, you know, trying to get into uh, square one, for example. Uh, it was about 1,500 people went into square one. Uh, the doors finally got opened, I don't know how. And uh, they were in there in all the hallways. Uh, but at least they were safe. The, the story is always told, the closer you were, the longer you were gone. You were out first and, and back last. And so if, if you're knocked on the door, at, you know, I think the first evacuation is about 1.30 in the morning um, on November 11th, and you got to knock on the door and you got to leave and you got 30 minutes to do it. I mean you don't know how long you're going, let alone how you pack, how you, where, where do you go, like everybody faced those those concerns. And... Uh, we started to uh, get calls from the hotels up on the airport road and uh, they were saying we've got all sorts of people out here, you know, uh, we haven't got any rooms for them, but we're willing to take them in, will somebody be responsible for it? What are you supposed to say? 
I said, do us a favor and take them in. <laughs> we'll do what we can. As time went on, we were also assigned to work uh, different shifts and patrol the, the homes. Um, we'd uh, also be assigned to go in and get animals out of the homes. Um, and towards the end of the week when uh, uh, things started to settle down, um, we actually went in and got some of the <clears throat> some of the clothing for uh, sick people, medications, and we escorted people in and out. So that particular weekend, my parents were away, and so we were staying with friends in the Credit Woodlands, and we lived in the Credit Woodlands as well. Um, anyway, when the uh, train derailed and they started evacuating people, uh, the first place that we went was Queen of Apostles Renewal Centre, which is on Mississauga, just off of Mississauga Road. We ended up going to one friend's house, my, my parents' friends, and we, then we got evacuated from there because they were down in Clarkson. Then we ended up going to Burlington to a friend's house there. So we weren't in a public place. We, were, we actually got to stay there. We didn't really take very much clothing. So the Orangeville Mall actually uh, donated clothes to us. People met each other in these um, shelters that they went to got to know each other, became friends. And so my mom went into labor that day, so they didn't have cell phones and she couldn't really get in touch with my dad. And I guess she was going towards Mississauga Hospital, which was what it was before. And then on her way there, the train derailment happened. And so they were evacuating everyone. So then she ended up getting moved to, um, I guess, Etobicoke General. But then she saw all the smoke and stuff like that because she was like on her way there. So then, Every time it's my birthday, she's always like, oh my God, there's this giant train derailment. So my dad could not find her. So he ended up getting evacuated to like square one, I guess it was like the holding area where they were kind of keeping everyone safe and stuff like that. And so he didn't find out till later on where my mom actually was. No one could go to work. No one could get back into Mississauga or even go through Mississauga. You couldn't take go trains. You couldn't drive. It was, it was blocked up. The most amazing feeling I've ever had, it's just, it was unreal. I was driving through a ghost town, driving down the road, not a soul in sight, nothing. When you're driving around the city of Mississauga, 250,000 people at that time, and uh, uh, nobody's on the road. There's no cars, no people, and, and it was kind of haunting. You know, that was, that kind of always stayed with me too, you know. I think the best memory was was that coming home, coming back home and being so grateful to have a, a home to come back to and how I remember looking at my fern and saying, oh, I love my fern, <laughs> you know, just, just um, simple things to be deeply appreciative. We, and from school, we all in the school, from Glen Forest Secondary School, we got a what certificate that we survived the, <laughs> the derail Mississauga the train, train derailment. derailment. Dubbed the Think Tank, a group of officials were organized to lead the emergency response, decision-making, and media alerts. This group was led by Solicitor General Roy McMurtry and included Deputy Minister John Hilton, Peel Regional Chair Frank Bean, City of Mississauga Mayor Hazel McCallion, Police Chief Douglas Burroughs, Police Staff Inspector Barry King, Deputy Police Chief William Taggart, Police Superintendent Carl Barnhart, Fire Chief Gordon Bentley, Deputy Fire Chief Arthur Warner, Chief Fire Inspector Cyril Hare, and CP officials, amongst others. Press and news updates were provided each day as the emergency unfolded. You have to understand that, that Mississauga, uh, like all municipalities in Ontario, is a child of the province. And what happened was the Honorable Roy McMurtry of the provincial government came out and he became, if you will, the chairman of the, the whole situation. Uh, he was um, the chairman of the think tank, but of course they included all of the people, Chief Bentley, they included uh, Chief Doug Burroughs of the police, and, um, um, and of course, Madam Mayor Hazel McCallion at the time. So they all sat on this think tank committee. So it was, a, it was quite a challenge, but we put together a, a team 
of uh, the fire department, police department, the province came out to help us. And, uh, and the staff of the city, I mean the department heads, uh, the OPP, chief of the OPP, uh, Chief Erskine came out. And so people really rallied to help us, realizing how serious it was. And uh, I ended up, I was part of the uh, emergency uh, management uh, meetings. I was, uh, Gord Bentley and I, there were two representatives from each agency, and so Gord and I were, were in, the, he was the fire chief and I was the chief fire inspector. We were in those meetings uh, where the decisions were made about evacuation and uh, different options as to how we would deal with the, the tank car. I uh, was requested to go to the scene to meet with the other people at the, um, they had brought in a kind of a command center uh, just south of the, uh, and they were contemplating starting to move a lot of people out and they wanted, uh, I guess they wanted my fingerprint on the decision. There was a hole in the end of the tank car, but the escaping chlorine, because of the intensity of the fire, the escaping chlorine was, it's an oxidizer, it was consumed in part of the fire. So all of that burning gas that was going up was, was actually combining with the chlorine and taking it away. We decided that uh, we had to stop the GO train going through Mississauga, and that was a big issue with the government. They didn't want to do that at all. And the biggest decision uh, uh, we made was to evacuate the Mississauga Hospital. Communication wasn't like it is now where we'll be uh, on the cell phone and on the you know, internet. It was basically you had to wait for the newspaper to print to take a look at the pictures. You really didn't know what was happening. That was the, that was the problem in those, uh, uh, those few days. People forget that. But it, it, there's an explosion, there's fire, there's people leaving. What's going on? How bad could it be? My dad tells the story that he and Margaret Marland, who was the uh, Ward 2 counselor at the time, they manned the phones because obviously there's a lot of residents who are calling in. So uh, he spent uh, most of his days, we'll call it in the war room down there, taking calls from residents to, uh, to ease their concerns um, and give as much uh, information and communicate with them as he could. So then they came up, uh, Procore was the manufacturer, happened to be in Oakville. And so they got Procore to build a cap to go over this thing because they knew the specs for the for the tank car so they could build a cap that would be the right curvature to fit over the hole and uh, brought that out and with the crane put it on and chained it down and then they evacuated the car. I was thinking of that little truck stop on Mavis Road. There was, the guy who ran it was a very friendly guy and he basically invited the media from all over the world into his little shop there and there were all the vending machines which were like uh, <clears throat> decimated by the media because there was no way to get food. And, like there weren't restaurants open or anything there, so uh, like it was just inside the restricted area. And people were there for long periods of time. Yeah, and e even the news reached my home city in in England in Leicester. My parents phoned up. I mean, that's all people were talking about. That's all everybody was talking about. And any family family that I had in California and Calgary, they were all calling. What, we see what's happening, we see what's happening, are you okay, are you okay? Because my uh, relatives from Italy called and they had even heard about it. I, I knew it was a real disaster when I saw Irv Weinstein from Channel 7 News in Buffalo there. He was the guy who always told us about fires in Tonawanda uh, every night in uh, Buffalo. So I knew it was a serious, uh, uh, it was a serious incident. The only person that got any kind of um, injury was the mayor. She stepped out of her car and I don't know whether she she went over the edge of the into a ditch and turned her ankle and I remember that her hobbling around on one leg. To, to this day you know my mom talks about this is what put Hazel Battalion on the map. The one thing that I, I will say is that uh, when you got Hazel as a mayor you don't have to worry too much. Uh, she has faith that if you say you can do something, you're going to do your best to do it. One of the successes of the Mississauga derailment was we kept the people fully informed. We didn't hold back anything. We told them exactly how serious it was. Secondly, we even monitored every newspaper 
We monitor the radio and TV to make sure that the information we were given out was not twisted, that it was the fact. On the third day, the fires were finally extinguished, and by 1 p.m., more than 110,000 people were allowed to return home. But those living closest to the accident were still not allowed back. The danger was still present from the leaking chlorine car, and work was undertaken to patch the damaged car in an attempt to remove the chlorine. It took several days, but by day six, the last of the chlorine was removed, and the final 33,000 evacuees were allowed to return home. Uh, when one officer had an idea, well, let's make them feel welcome. Well, we'll be at every location where they're coming in. We'll just wave them through slow. They welcome home. And they had uh, big pieces of cardboard, and they wrote welcome home and put them on signs and propped them up against all the uh, all the telephone poles around. And uh, so it was nice. Just added a little bit, you know. Okay, there was, then it was a lar the largest peacetime evacuation. And now there would be like twice as many would have to go if something like that happened. And down the road, uh, weeks later, there was uh, something like 33,000 cubic meters of soil to be removed and decontaminated. Yeah, well, I, I got a, a couple of real good whiffs during the explosion going on, and I was very close to it. Uh, and then uh, later on, when I was on the north side, and I was with the firefighter, and he got a, a, an awful dose, and I got one too. But it was didn't knock me down or anything like that. I, I probably was turned turned away from it as it was going by, and he probably turned into it for all I know. <coughs> so um, the mayor, after about six months, uh, uh, a lot of us were still coughing up phlegm, green phlegm, you know. And uh, when she heard about that, she it wasn't just us; it was some of the you know firefighters. So they, uh, she demanded that the government uh, get the Ministry of Health out here, or Occupational Health and Safety, and do tests on us all. Uh, so the, we were pouring tons of water onto this, and of course the ditches sloped away from it to the east and was carrying the runoff well, and we had to get involved in damming that up and stopping it from getting out and into the creek system. Um, a lot of the emergency planning that we have now in Canada, a lot of it um, was accelerated or, or I guess helped because of what happened there. And people realized that they needed better emergency planning. Because emergency planning isn't just like the fire department or the police department, it's, it's, it's the whole or overall municipal organization or government organization. Uh, we had an emergency plan and it worked. We have a much better one now. And a lot of communities did not have an emergency plan. And after the Mississauga derailment, the province legislated that every municipality had to have an emergency plan. It was uh, it was uh, an experience, life experience. I'm glad I never missed. Uh, we learned so much. In fact, the one thing that really got me was I had to do 300 uh, presentations all over the United States and Canada to different police departments and uh, uh, what they would do in Tennessee and uh, uh, places like that. The governors would uh, host it, and they would bring representatives of all their police departments and fire departments in. And uh, sometimes we'd have four or 500 people there and they made it into an emergency planning day. And I'd speak for three hours. And then uh, they'd have other, other people there. I, I was involved for 11 months uh, gathering lawyers and witnesses and leading the evidence along with Bob Armstrong as to what happened and uh, what should happen in the future. Uh, and that was over in about 11 months. We and Grange, uh, Armstrong and I, uh, sat in the House of Commons and our, our report was put to the House. 
And as a result of what happened there, um, there were newer, more stringent regulations brought out for transportation of dangerous goods, a lot more information on, uh, on placarding and identification, um, more, more stringent rules on the design of tank cars, more stringent rules on uh, the, uh, the wheels and, ro and bearings for the, the cars. It was given a significance, or its historical significance, is much more permanent than a similar catastrophe would have in today's environment. I ended up um, collecting a lot of newspaper articles, but I also got this t-shirt that says uh, Mississauga evacuation tanks for the memories, you know, kind of silly. Of course, I can't wear it anymore, but <laughs> I've kept it all these years and I've kept all the newspaper articles and I actually wrote out almost like a diary of my experience when, when this happened. Oh, I think it was a defining moment for the maturity of a city, you know, where uh, we dealt with a, a large disaster. And, you know, Mississauga up to that point was kind of the a bedroom community of Toronto. And they had little villages like Streetsville and Port Credit and so forth. But yeah, I think it was a coming of age uh, uh, experience for the city. Uh, maybe before that, uh, People might have heard of Mississauga. They certainly knew about it afterwards. So it may very well have been a, a I think it was one of the biggest defining moments of, of a young city. The, the thing that I guess I feel the best about is that uh, it was the largest evacuation in North America at the time. Uh, had a few, unfortunately, that have got bigger than that, but we weren't trying to win any contests. Uh, but nobody was hurt. I mean, except, yeah, some residue like that, but there's nobody died. I really expected we were going to be getting sheets at the end of the week, you know, that uh, there's three people died here, two people died there, nothing. November 10th, 2019 marks the 40th anniversary of the Mississauga train derailment. The derailment tested our young city and our citizens as they had never been tested before. It forced our citizens to flee. It placed our city's name in international headlines for the first time. The ramifications and investigations led to industry changes in the transportation of hazardous materials. Yet through it all, the train derailment remains the most significant chapter in the ever-evolving Mississauga story, a moment in time that connected all of Mississauga residents through a common experience. A test by fire. I talk to people about their um, derailment experiences when I get the chance because everybody's got a story about the derailment. Everybody remembers very vividly. My favorite memory, well, yeah. probably uh, um, hanging out with my cousins and my brothers at my uncle's house. Uh, and, uh, and I think it was also pretty exciting for us because we knew it was a big deal uh, and we were getting direct information from my dad who was obviously staying in touch with my mom. Um, to do that. So I think we kind of felt like we were part of the whole uh, process as kids. Again, uh, quite young, so it's, uh, it's, it was hard for us to really grasp uh, the magnitude of, of what had actually happened. In, in the ensuing days, of course, uh, the community rallied together because people were being moved out of the area. And I think just sort of from what I can remember of all of that is that nobody pulled out their job descriptions to see what they should be doing. They just did what needed to be done at the time. And uh, so it was uh, kind of a rewarding experience that way. I, I think I put Mississauga on the map, being the largest um, peacetime evacuation that has it ever occurred. I had an official Mississauga evacuation or evacuee t-shirt that was made just after that. And uh, I remember going down to Florida and people saw the shirt and immediately they knew, and they knew about Mississauga, which was really put Mississauga on the map um, because nobody had heard that and nobody knew how to spell that. For me, it's a vivid memory because I wore glasses from the time I was two years old and I packed my glasses in case we were evacuated. When we weren't evacuated, I couldn't find my glasses. And for a year I went without them and lo and behold, my eyes corrected themselves. So <laughs> I always refer to it as uh the chlorination of Hazel McCallion. Policing at that time was different than it is today. I don't know what we'd be doing today. Uh, I mean, the police officers have still got their skills. They've got the, you know, the ability to, to do certain things. 
I don't think we'd have as much cooperation from the public because they question more now today, you know, and so we didn't have to put that put up with that. There was the odd person, but very odd in fact then the other ten people standing near him would say, Hey, let's go, you know, that type of thing. A, a lot of conversation about folks who like they didn't have family close by. So they were at evacuation centers and so that was a whole nother bit of conversation because those are things that as as folks with family in many different communities we could keep going and keep uh, keep moving on to the next one as we went and i think you know if there's any good that ever comes out of a tragedy then that is that the community comes together to support each other and help each other i mean you kind of wish this would happen every day not the tragedy the coming together I wasn't even familiar with the intersection where it occurred at the time, but uh, in subsequent years learned that it was, uh, well, it was very close to where my grandparents' house was and very close to where my mom grew up, actually, at the old brickyard. And so that gave it uh, a little bit more uh, importance to me in later years. Um, and, you know, going back and visiting the site, I was able to go back and, and kind of look at it and soak it all in, soak in this history, which I... I was involved in, but I'll have only a very peripheral memory of. This idea of, of people fleeing and trying to find temporary accommodations and then, you know, supporting yourself when you're there, you know, the whole logistics around food and kids and, um, you know, the clothing and not knowing how long you're away, not being able to get back. I mean, there's, a, there's an uncertainty there that underlied much of what we did. And only a couple of weeks ago, we had a family reunion and we were talking about the derailment. And although some of the, the, the older generation now who were the ones who, who took us in then, they don't have clear memories perhaps of it, but everybody remembers that moment in time of, of you know, when you invaded their house and then they had to leave. And it, a, a lot of humor around it, a lot of, a lot of good natured stories of this, this, this time that kind of brought families together, brought people together, a common experience.